Well, thank you, Ashley, for that wonderful song. What a tremendous, you know, you just can't be better and do better than those old hymns. Uh, they just have so much uh, doctrine and so much to say to us. Uh, I did want to say uh, that I appreciate all of your patience and your kindness uh, in allowing me to travel. I've been, I've been doing a lot of traveling lately, and that is all stopping uh, today. Uh, I have all of my commitments made. Uh, we don't have anything else on the horizon for the rest of the year. And uh, all the way into February, Lord willing, uh, we will be here for every service. And I will be preaching Sunday morning uh, next week for Thanksgiving. And then Brother Andrew Johnson will be uh, speaking at our Thanksgiving meal banquet. Uh, but uh, just want to let you know that I appreciate your faithfulness, and I know that I've been gone quite a bit lately, uh, but uh, we're going to uh, be able to get into some series and get into some teaching and preaching uh, that will take a little while, so I'm looking forward to uh, stopping all the traveling and being here uh, where I belong and being with, here with you good folk, and so we're just glad to be able to do that. Glad for the opportunity, though, to go and preach and to host to family conferences last, uh, like last week and do other things, other preaching and things like that. It's a blessing, but I appreciate a church to let me do that a little while. Uh, and then uh, some of you have said, uh, Preacher, we are, are we going to see you, you know, in the next couple months? And I've been, <laughs> uh, I've been uh, touched by that. I'm glad that you uh, appreciate it. You know, a lot of good preachers, if they're really smart, I was always taught this, always make sure that you have a lot of guest speakers and that you're gone a lot. That way the people don't get tired of you. You know, because I preach a lot, and I get tired of myself. I get tired of my own preaching. And so I know that y'all do. So we, we had a good break from Brother Roy Webster there for a little while, but now we're going to get back to it. So I appreciate your faithfulness and your uh, support on that. Tonight I uh, told you uh, this morning that we would be talking about the fact, and I don't know if you've ever sat down to contemplate this, but uh, there are some people that just seem like they get away with everything. Have you ever noticed somebody like that? Now don't raise your hand and certainly don't look at them if they're in here. <laughs> uh, make sure that you, you don't, uh, you know, say anything to them on the way out. But there are some people that it just seems like they get away with everything. It seems like nothing ever kind of comes to roost in, in their life. They never seem to pay the consequences. And, and it just seems like it's unfair, really. When you think about it, you sit down and you think about those things. You think, you know, why, where's the justice? Where is the, uh, the judgment of God? Where is God in all this? Uh, there are a lot of people, saved and unsaved, that get away with all kinds of things, and it seems like uh, their life just goes on, and, and there's no consequences to their actions. So why do some people, uh, then on the other flip side of that, why do some people get caught the very first time? I've known people like that as well. Uh, and now that there's these super drugs that we have in our society today, there are young people and, and college-age people that the very first time they take a drug, they get fentanyl list, uh, laced in it, and they die. And that's something that needs to be told and needs to be warning our young people and, and older people alike that, hey, there's no such thing as a gateway drug anymore. There's no such way, a thing as just smoking a little bit of this or taking a little bit of that. Uh, your very first time in, in trying drugs can be your last. I've known people that uh, had a promiscuous relationship with their girlfriend or boyfriend, and the very first time that that happened, they got pregnant. And then I've known other people that were doing that for years and years and years, and that never happened. I've known people that go out and drink every Friday and Saturday night, and they drive home. And they've not one time ever had drunk driving charges or ever had a wreck or anything like that. And then I've known people that went out the very first time, got drunk, got in a car, and crashed and killed people, or they got a DWI. It doesn't seem to, be, it doesn't seem to make any sense. It, does, it seems to be so random. Why can, can a teenager or a young person sit down and some teenagers get away with cheating on tests all the time? They're selling the answers. They're doing things on the Internet. They're doing all this different stuff. And then the very first time that one guy or one girl does that, they're, you know, expelled from school and all these different things happen to them. And it's the very first time they ever looked on somebody else's page or got the notes or the, the answer key from the Internet. It's kind of uh, amazing when you think about it, and it seems across the board that it would be so unjust and so unfair that some would get caught the very first time they do something, and then some live a whole life of committing that sin, and they never seemingly 
get caught. I've always thought it was amazing, and I would always like to talk to Adam and Eve, and I will one day, talk to them and ask them what they thought about what God's pronouncement from their sin was. You see, God told them if they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they would die. And they ate of the tree, and they lived for 900 more years. I wonder what they thought. We got away with that. Now, they got kicked out of the garden. There were some obvious consequences there, but they didn't physically die. I've always wondered what Adam thought about that. God said, you will surely die. And they didn't. Of course, we know, looking back with all the revelation of Scripture, that they died spiritually in that moment and caused spiritual death to go from every person that had ever been born after that. But they didn't know that. They knew they disobeyed God. And they just assumed that they would fall dead at the very moment that they ate the fruit, I would assume. You know, I think of David's sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. You see, David called in Bathsheba and had relations with her. And then the baby was born and he found out that the baby was, that she was pregnant. And it was nine months before anybody found out. And Uriah was killed by David and put him in the front of the battle. And all, Joab and all the army backed up on him. And left him, abandoned him there on the wall of the city. And you know who knew about that? David, God, and Joab. They're the only ones. And see, it seemed like David got away with it. You say, well, yeah, but violence and, and murder and all these horrible things followed David the rest of his life. Yes, we know that because the scripture tells us that. But if you're a regular person in the land of Israel, you don't know that's why. You know, there's probably lots of people in that country and in that nation that never knew what David did. I think of Cain and Abel and the sin there. I think of Saul and the bleeding sheep. <laughs> How many people really knew what happened with Saul and why the kingdom was taken from him? What about Achan and Ai? God was the only one that knew what Achan did. Absolutely nobody else but the people in his family, when he went in there to hide those things in his tent, they were the only ones that knew what happened. And had God not made a spectacle of him and made a, an example of him, no one would have ever known why they lost the battle. No one would have ever known that Achan took those things that were prohibited by God's word. You see, in many of these occasions, it seems like the people got away with it. But there's always at the back of it, there's always somebody that knows. And it's God. And I see in the history of most of these people that we're talking about, some uh, that were judged much earlier than others in their life, I see a pattern that develops. And when they seemingly get away with something, then they continue to do that something and they continue to digress. So they really didn't get away with it. It just gets worse and worse and worse, whether anybody knows about it or not. Go to our text tonight in 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And this may be a strange text to preach this message from, but I, I'm preaching it, so, uh, you know, this is just where I decided the Lord wanted me to go. So, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 24. Now, the reason it's a strange text to go to for this message is because the whole chapter 5 of, verse, of, of t 1 Timothy is dealing, first of all, with widows and widows indeed and how they should be treated in the church. And then we move into uh, Paul's admonition to uh, preacher boy Timothy about how he should ordain and what he's looking for in a, in a pastor and in elders at the church and what should happen and how they should be judged and how they should be uh, disciplined if they're out of, of line and out of sorts or in sin, and it, we're going through this whole idea of how you should put preachers and pastors in the leadership of the church, and then what should happen if they fall from that leadership, and they fall in sin. And look in verse 24. Paul gives Timothy this warning about preachers, but we can apply it to ourselves. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment. And some men, they follow after. 
Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Now, it works both ways for the good things that people do and the bad things that people do. You see, the sometimes the bad, the sin that people do, it goes out in front of them. And everybody finds out really quickly. Before even judgment can be pronounced, before they even go to the judgment seat of God or the great white throne judgment, everybody knows what's happened in their life. But some men, their sins follow after them and nobody knows. You see, some men, to everyone else's dismay and to everyone else's surprise and shock, they're living a sinful lifestyle and nobody knows. You see, some people, unfortunately, are better at covering up their sin than others. Some people are a lot more crafty at it. Some people are a lot more deceitful. They're a lot better at lying. I knew some kids in my, in in elementary, when I was that age, you know, when it was really, uh, you're really working on telling the truth and you exaggerated a lot, you're prone to tell lies and those kind of things. I remember that some kids were just good at it. Man, I mean, they could spin a yarn, they could throw this thing out there, and it sounded believable, and they believed it, and everybody else believed it. And and then some kids are just like terrible liars. I mean, they don't even barely open their mouth, and you're just like, that's not true. You see, some men, Paul is telling Timothy while he's looking for elders and pastors to go to take churches and to be in that prominent so important position he's telling Timothy look some men you have to understand their sins go out before them and it'll be obvious that their life is a mess it will be obvious that they had do not have the characteristics of a pastor it will be obvious that they do not have the personality and their sin uh, their sin is invested in their life and it's such a way that it's obvious to everyone that they should not be candidated for the pastorate But then there's some. Paul tells Timothy that their sins follow after them. They won't be judged for their sins until we get to the judgment. And Paul tells Timothy, there's some men, Timothy, that you can't tell that they're living a sinful lifestyle. I'm I'm not going to get into it, but just let me suffice this part to say. I have been shocked and utterly dismayed at some of the preachers that have fallen in the ministry since I've been old enough to know what that means. I have been appalled and shocked at some of the men and what they were doing that nobody knew about. You see, some people's sins are open beforehand, the Bible says. They're evident to everybody. It always cracks me up. It's sad, but it's it's almost comical. You'll get up next to someone that's drunk, and they go, you can't tell I'm drunk, can you? (laughs) Yeah, we can. And I'll have people, not so much now, but back in the past, you'd have people come up to you and say, yeah, preacher, you know, I I used to smoke a lot before, but I, I gave it up. And I'm like, no, you didn't. I could take one whiff and tell you you just smoked about an hour ago. You see, some people's sins are evident. They're all over them. They're they're obvious. But then, some people's sins follow after them and they're hidden. They're secret. They're kept in private. And only their family and God knows about what they're doing. You see, there's really two classes of sins when you think about this in this context. There are seen sins, and there are unseen sins. There are the seen, the visible sins, and the invisible sins, if you would like to say it that way, to everyone else. I'm talking about to the people that are living around those people. You say, well, how can that be, preacher? Why does God let that happen? Why is that a, why is that a possibility for all these people to get away with all these sins? Well, we need to look at the process of sin. And I think it would do all of us good to remind ourselves of how sin works. Go in your Bibles to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And if you memorize Scripture, which I would encourage you to do, this is a great place to start. 
James chapter 1, many of you have it memorized. Verse 14 says this. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. Now, let me stop there real quick. You are drawn away, you're tempted by your own lust. You're not necessarily tempted by my lust. And I'm not necessarily tempted by your lust. The devil knows what each and every one of us, where our weak spot is and what we lust after. What he can tempt us with. Uh, Let me tell you, there's a lot of things. If I'm hungry and I'm really, really super starving and, and I get to a buffet, there's some things that do not tempt me at all. Like broccoli. Now, I'm sure... I know, I know, that if I were on a deserted island and I had not had anything to eat for, let's say, 40 days, and I was on death's door and about to die, then I might consider eating broccoli with a whole bunch of cheese on it. Or I might consider eating mushrooms or some of the other things that I detest. But some of you, when you go to a buffet, you head right towards the broccoli. What is wrong with you people? Now, there are some that don't like Lay's or Pringles salt and vinegar chips. But now, I'm tempted really bad with those things. They are addictive to me. I just had a bag of them the other night, and they, uh, I can't stop. I eat the whole bag. It's just, and some of you smell that, and you see, you see that, and you go, oh, it's so gross. It's not your lust. Just leave it alone. <laughs> if you get those in your house and you don't like them, give them to me. You see, we're all tempted by different things. There's some that are so tempted to lie, and some that are so tempted to steal, and some that are so tempted with, with entertainment and, and music, and some that are so tempted with pornography, and some that are tempted with alcohol, and some that are tempted with drugs. Let me tell you, you can parade all the alcohol in front of this place that you want to. I'm not ever going to drink it. I'm not tempted by it at all. But some are, you see. So you need to understand that you're going to be drawn away of your own lust. It's not somebody else's problem. It's not somebody else's weakness. It's yours, and you need to know what yours is. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. There's the temptation. There's the devil dangling the carrot. I was watching this uh, sporting event the other day, and it was a dog race, and I've never seen this before. I thought they used to have to have the little white bunny out there on the string, and they made the bunny go real fast, and... And those greyhounds would chase that thing, and they're, they're so fast. They didn't have a bunny the other day when I was watching that. They had a plastic bag. And the plastic bag flutters in the wind when it's going across on that line going really fast. And I'm telling you, one of those uh, uh, greyhounds almost caught that thing. Listen, you can put a plastic bag out there all you want to. I'm not running after that thing. But boy, something in those greyhounds' mind goes, run, run, get it, get it. They're tempted. They are tempted by that. I'm not. <laughs> I, don't, I couldn't believe it in California. We had to pay for the plastic bags. At least they're better bags than we got in Texas, praise the Lord. Got to pay a dollar for that thing. Where was I? Got lost on plastic bags. <laughs> And enticed, tempted. When you get your lust and it's put out in front of you, you're going to be tempted. Now listen, it's not a sin to be tempted. We're all tempted all the time. All of you, every which way in your life, whatever you lust after, whatever you desire, whatever is tempting to you, you're presented with that all the time. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, there it is, when lust is given into, when you succumb, when you give up and you get into it and you begin to indulge in it, you begin to sin in it, you begin to wallow in it, then when lust is conceived, 
It bringeth forth sin. When you play with your temptation and your lust long enough, you're going to conceive a sin baby. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth the most wonderful life ever. Isn't it a wonderful life? No. It brings forth death. You need to know the process of sin. And so what happens, there are some people that just go headlong into this thing and their lust, they're tempted, they're enticed, they, they succumb to that temptation and they lose their mind. They really do. They lose all rationale, they, ru- they lose all logic. I'm not saying this is a good or a bad thing, I'm just telling you why some people get caught and some people don't. They lose all rationale. They lose all thinking. They, they lose all their, their time frame. They lose everything about where they were and what they were doing, just like I did with the plastic bag. That's what happens to them. And they get caught. And then some are much more astute than that. And they entice, they're enticed and they're tempted and they fall into sin, but they are well within their faculties, and those are the scary people. When you can succumb to your lust and delve into that lifestyle and delve into that sin, being a child of God, and you can keep your wits about you and you can keep your faculties about you and you can go around like absolutely nothing's happening, those are the people that you ought to be scared of. Matter of fact, now, I don't know why, I have no idea why, but it's very popular to watch these different documentaries and these different movies about serial killers. I don't know why that fad is going around right now, but it is. So I did some study, and there was what was called, unfortunately so, the American serial killer, Ted Bundy. And in the 1970s, he confessed, confessed to, they think there was many more, maybe double this number of people that he killed. But he confessed to the murders of 30 women. He was finally executed in the state of Florida in 1989. This was going on in the 70s and 80s, uh, before some of you were born, uh, and uh, in the middle of some of your lives. The day before he was executed, Ted Bundy met with Dr. James Dobson for an interview. And I... I wish I could have seen it live. I've seen it in the recording now of it. And during the interview, he told Dr. Dobson about his addiction to pornography. And here's an excerpt from that interview that I wrote down from the video. Ted Bundy said, I would keep looking for more potent and more graphic kinds of material until I'd reached the point where pornography only goes so far. Then you begin to wonder if maybe actually doing it will give you that which is beyond just reading about it and looking at it. Basically, now listen to this. He said, I was a normal person. I wasn't some guy hanging out in bars or a bum. I lived a normal life. And he did. As a matter of fact, he went to law school. He was involved in all kinds of politics. He was a a political advocate for a couple different governors and people high up. As a matter of fact, a lot of people thought he was going to run for public office. He said, I lived a normal life except for this one small, very potent, very destructive segment that I kept very secret. Boy, that ought to scare us to death. You see, Ted Bundy was a man that his sins followed after. Nobody knew what was going on. Nobody knew the atrocities that he was committing when nobody was watching. Except him, his victims, and God. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 and verse 1, if you're a child of God here this morning, this may be 
well, even if you're not, if you're a, a lost person as well, this may be the most terrifying portion of Scripture of all the New Testament. In Luke 12, verse 1, the Bible says, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. After that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. You know, one thing I'll say about the 70s and the 80s, when I was, I was a little bitty kid in the 70s and growing up and being a, a teenager in the 80s, and there was a lot that went on, uh, some that I'm in, in agreement with, some that I'm not in, in churches, some of the style and the methods and things like that I thought were uh, outrageous, some of the things I thought were great. But one of the things that I appreciated back in the 70s and 80s is in church, I had an incredible fear of God. You say, well, preacher, that's not a good thing. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah, it is. You see, because I knew, and I just had it in the back of my mind, that if I ever got out of line, God, my, my worst fear in life is being crippled. It's not dying. It's not having this, you know, no money or no finances or losing even my family. My, my worst fear in life is being crippled. I don't know why. And I just knew. That if I sinned and got offline, God was going to make me cripple. You say, well, preacher, that's unrational. That's not even real. That's not even what God would do. No, I understand that now. But let me tell you, there's nothing wrong with the healthy fear of God. And now that we've gotten to where we've gotten to in our Christian circles and in our churches today where nothing is more preached but love and peace and the love of God and I'm all for that and God is love but God is also righteousness and indignation and you better understand you may be the kind of person that your sins are all out in front of you and they may be evident to the whole world and you may get caught the very first time you do something or you may be one of the people that nobody knows what you're doing and when you're alone, you do things that nobody would ever believe. And you may be one in 1 Timothy 5 that your sins are following after you, but understand this. God knows. And one of these days, you will either give an account. If you're a child of God, you will not give an account for your sins because they're under the blood. Praise the Lord. But you will give an account for what you have not done. In this life and in this body because of your sins that followed you. And for those that don't know Christ as their personal Savior, everything they've ever said, done, thought is written down in the book of God. And it will be displayed for all of mankind. I know one thing. If your sins go out in front of you, or your sins follow behind you, I would say that we better have a healthy fear of God, and we better confess them and get them right, whether they're in front or in behind. You see, the Bible's very clear. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. It appears that people get away with things, and they, they just go on and on and on sinning in their life, and nothing ever happens. But, oh, let me tell you, God knows, and their life has not turned out the way God designed it. Even if they're a child of God and they're sinning like that, their relationship with God is non-existent. Their blessings are non-existent. Their life is not what God designed it to be. Let me tell you, if you have your sins out in front or you have them following behind you, confess them Get them right with God and try your very best with the power and the word of God to not go there anymore. Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? Every head bowed and every eye closed tonight. Heavenly Father.
oh, we come to you, and Lord, it seems that even many a Christian will get away with a lot of sin in their life. It's, we know that you know about it, and we know that you're dealing with it in your way and in your time. Lord, at times in my life, I've always wondered why there were some that just barely dabbled in sin and they got caught or there was great judgment involved. But Lord, these, these verses, as you encourage the Apostle Paul to help young preacher boy Timothy to understand when he was looking for qualified elders and pastors to take over churches, we need to understand that obviously if there's sins that are evident in somebody's life, we can't allow them to be a pastor. But, Lord, we need to understand that there's always the possibility that people are living a double life. There's always the possibility that people are sinning in private and no one knows. But, Lord, help us to never forget that you know. And really, the truth of the matter is, is that you're the most important person in this whole equation. And, God, you have said that you won't be mocked. You won't be made fun of. You won't be having a joke played on you. People will reap what they sow. If we sow to the Spirit, we will reap life everlasting. If we sow to the flesh, we'll reap corruption. God, would you help us to sow our lives in the right place? We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray.